Welcome to Kitchen Table Electronics, Lesson 5.1, Measuring Peak-to-Peak -peak Voltages. In the last module, you saw how to program a digital frequency synthesis chip. So now the computer can be programmed to output any voltage you want it to. So the next uh, problem is how to measure how a circuit responds. You could, of course, use your lovely little O1 oscilloscope and measure the peak voltage from the screen and write it down by hand, but that's not how we're going to do it. We're going to build a peak-to-peak -peak voltage detector that we can then interface with the Arduino, and so the Arduino will program our frequency out and read a voltage in. So how do you measure the peak value of an AC waveform, that is an alternating sine wave waveform? Well, one way to do this is to use the diode you saw before when we looked at the characteristics of components, that a diode conducts in only one direction, and therefore the voltage that will pass through a diode should correspond to, for example, only the positive voltage, and so we can use this as a starting point in finding a peak voltage. So here is our first experiment. We are going to program our AD9850 to give a 10 kilohertz output. And here it is. Our scope probe is on the output pin of the AD9850. Actually, it's on a pin in the little circuit board I attached to the 9850. Uh, because I don't want to mess with the 9850 board. And here is the output of the AD9850 at 10 kilohertz. And then in series with that, a diode, and then a scope probe on the other side of the diode. Now, notice that I am also putting a resistor to ground on this side of the diode. The reason for that is that the oscilloscope has a very high input resistance or impedance, a word we'll get more familiar with later. And so the diode actually will never see current passing through it and won't turn on unless you put a load here to ground. So that's what this is for. And sure enough, when we look at the waveform here, um, we see that the output is rectified. That is, only uh, voltage above a certain positive limit is coming out. Wonderful. Notice, though, one thing that we're cheating a little bit with here. Remember, these little markers mark the zero of voltage. And if you look at this, you can see that the AD9850 generates voltages that are all above zero. And it's not surprising that it does this. It's powered by a 5 volt supply, and this waveform is digitally synthesized. And so we're not looking at what we want to really which is a sine wave symmetrical about zero and determining the peak of that. So how do we make the output of the AD9850 symmetrical about zero? Well, we go ahead and use a capacitor. Remember, capacitors block DC and pass AC. So I here have taken a 0.1 microfarad uh, capacitor, put it in series with the AD9850 output, and then if we put our scope probe here, rather than on the AD9850, we can now see, looking at this little red tab, that this voltage is going more or less symmetrically about the zero. Not quite, because the waveform is not a perfect sine wave. So now we put our second scope probe on the resistor and, uh-oh, nothing. Why is this? Well, if we go down to the peak-to-peak -peak voltage measured by our oscilloscope, we can see here that it is about uh, 1.8, a little bit under volts. And this means that the positive going part of this, which is half of this, is uh, about uh, 8 or 9 tenths of a volt. But this is only a tiny little bit more than that forward voltage drop of the diode uh, that we measured when we measured the characteristics of diodes and transistors in an earlier module. So the problem is the forward voltage drop of the diode is preventing us from measuring peak voltage properly. We need the world's most perfect diode with no forward voltage drop. 
Well, that doesn't exist, but this is where the op amp comes to the rescue. Okay, here we go. Here is uh, an op amp circuit for making a perfect diode. We're using the TLV2462 again. We'll use one of the two op amps on the chip. Remember, these days we're taking the VDD plus the 5 volt pin and we are putting a capacitor to ground since this reduces the risk of the chip uh, oscillating. Um, here is our AC uh, coupling. Um, I've put this resistor in here as a precaution so that when this circuit is switched off, any charge stored on this capacitor is not discharged through the um, circuit here too rapidly. And I've also put this resistor to ground because this chip has such a high input impedance that it has a tendency to charge up uh, unless you deliberately hold one of the inputs at ground. And that's what I'm doing with this 47 kilo ohm resistor here. Now here is the magic bit. As always, the op amp is used with negative feedback applied. That is to say the output is uh, fed back to the uh, inverting terminal. And remember that the op amp uses feedback in such a way that the inverting terminal and the non-inverting terminal are at the same potential. So as this voltage comes down towards zero, the output of this op amp will want this side at the inverting terminal to come down towards zero. But this diode has a forward voltage drop. How does it guarantee that this point comes smoothly down to zero? The answer is by raising the potential of this point to drive current through the diode to keep it at whatever small positive voltage is needed to keep the difference between these two terminals the same. I'll let you go away and think about that, but that is the basis of all op amp operation. And you'll see, and when you build this circuit, that this does indeed produce a perfect rectifier. So let's go ahead, build that circuit. I think you know how to do this by now, and I've included the pin out here so you know what you're doing on your board. Always remember, check with your meter before you load anything onto your precious AD9850 or Arduino. And let's take a look. Here is the um, circuit on fritzing. You can pause this video and take a screenshot if you want. Uh, the PowerPoint's also available, of course, on the website. And here is my um, actual um, circuit. You see the diode here going between the output of the op amp and the inverting input. Here's the coupling capacitor. And uh, here is this 47K uh, to ground. I don't see my 1K, but I know it was I know it was there in the circuit at one point. It's hiding somewhere. And here's the board with my 89850 on. All right, assuming you have that uh, all assembled and you've checked the circuit and it matches what's shown in the schematic before and the layout here. Let's take a look at the output. So um, in this particular screenshot, I went and put the probe on the uh, AD9850 side of the capacitor, which was a bit silly because I want to show that this works when the sine wave is symmetrical. Um, but nonetheless, you already saw that when you look on the other side of the capacitor, the sine wave is indeed more or less symmetrical around zero. And now look at the output. Here it is, a beautiful, perfect rectifier. Once again, ignore the zero here because I simply put the scope probe on the wrong side of the capacitor. Um, I can tell you and you can see for yourself that this input really was going symmetrically around zero. And here you see a perfect rectifier. Just one comment about putting two traces like this on the O1. Do make sure that the O1 trigger is set in the trigger panel, which is accessible over here. Make sure that the trigger is, is set to single, meaning triggering from a single channel and not alternate. What the alternate does is to trigger the O1 from one channel and then the other, which causes a loss of synchronization on alternate channels. So do make sure the trigger is set to single. We know how to make a perfect rectifier 
we want to store the peak voltage coming out of the rectifier on a capacitor. And so in this more complicated circuit, this is the storage capacitor right here. We've used a 0.47 or about half microfarad capacitor. Now, before I go on to explain how that works, let's take a look at some changes we've made in our diode circuit. First of all, I've used a potentiometer that we wired up in one of the first classes, uh, connected one end to the AD5809850 uh, uh, AC output pin, the other end to ground, and the wiper here then picks off some fraction of the AD9850 voltage, so you can adjust it using this pop. This is the AC coupling capacitor that guarantees that this point now goes symmetrically above and below ground. This was this one kilo ohm resistor we put in to protect the chip in the event of power down from discharging current through here. And I've changed that 47 kilo ohm resistor now to a 100 kilo ohm resistor just to increase the input impedance of this circuit a little bit. I've also put a 1 kilo ohm resistor in the feedback loop here. It has no effect at all except to protect the chip uh, from discharge of this capacitor in this case. Um, the reason being, of course, that this voltage here will go to whatever value it has to to take account of A, the drop across the diode, which is the most significant thing, and B, any small residual voltage drop across this resistor, which given the fact that this terminal has almost infinite resistance is going to be zero. Nonetheless, my point is that you can put things in the feedback loop and it will still work. So we still have our perfect diode detector there. We built that and we understand it. And now what we've done is we put a capacitor here and I am reading the output on a voltage follower. That is to say, this is the same arrangement as this, only now the output is directly connected back to the input. So the output voltage will follow whatever appears here. The reason for doing that is because the input impedance of this chip is very, very high. So it's a perfect readout mechanism of whatever goes on here. Now I have put a resistor across this capacitor because I don't want it to store the peak voltage forever and ever and ever. Um, otherwise, when the voltage drops down, I won't be able to read it. So I've chosen a compromise here by using a one mega ohm resistor across the capacitor here. I have a time constant R, uh, R times C of about half a second. What does this mean? Well, this means as you get to low frequencies, this voltage stored here is going to droop a bit because what will happen is you'll go from one peak out of the diode back to zero. This will then start discharging through this one mega ohm resistor. Then you'll go back up to the peak again and you'll see that this point, instead of just holding the peak, will fall very slightly. We'll see the effect of that even at frequencies on the order of 100 hertz or so. Uh, however, what this does mean is that as long as you wait more than half a second between measurements, this circuit will have recovered from what was measured before and it will record a new peak value. So once again, this RC time constant is a compromise. If I had no resistor here, it would be essentially an infinite time and I could never ever look at lower peak voltages once I'd looked at a high peak voltage. Um, so this has the uh, compromise here that we also can't look at very low frequencies. We're not going to use them, so don't worry. Now we're using both op amps on the chip. Here's the pinout from the chip. It's still one chip, but the circuit is going to get a little bit more complicated. So here is a fritzing layout. Once again, you can take this from the PowerPoint uh, on the website. Um, and uh, uh, it will guide you in setting your own board up. Uh, here's a photograph of my board. Um, so let me just point out some of the uh, components, the resistors. I think you can see all of those. Um, I Where is my, oh, my diode's hiding down here underneath this 1K resistor. This is the 0.47 microfarad capacitor that I, I'm using as a storage of the peak voltage. So here's the output of the diode 
going to that with that 1K feedback resistor. Here's the input capacitor, the 0.1 microfarads, and the signal from the potentiometer coming in here. And here's my 89850 board. I think this is the other wire from the potentiometer grounding it. And then the third wire is going to the output of the 89850. And then here's an output going uh, to my scope and another channel of the scope being connected here on this side of the input capacitor. Uh, one comment I will make is here I chose to bring out my little wire snippers and reduce the lead length of some of these resistors because this circuit is now dense enough that if you go knocking the resistors the wires will, will hit each other and you don't want that. So I did, once I'd laid the board out and got everything working, I then trimmed the components down so that the wires went jutting out uh, for ridiculous lengths. Once again, uh, go check with your meter, make sure there are no shorts, make sure you're not shorting, shorting the plus five volts to ground uh, from the uh, Arduino or the 89850 or indeed the output to the Arduino. All right, now let's take a look at this circuit. And for now, we're going to just be reading it on the oscilloscope. So here we go. I have set the frequency to 10 kilohertz. Um, the channel one is set to 500 millivolts, half a volt per division. Channel two, the yellow uh, channel is 200 millivolts per division. And so you can see then on channel 1, it thinks there's about 1.3 volts peak to peak. Notice because I now sens sensibly have moved my scope probe onto the far side of the capacitor that this waveform is going both positive and negative of uh, zero. There is a little offset because this is not a perfect sine wave, but it's going both positive and negative of zero. And channel 2 now, here's the zero on channel 2. And you can see it's giving a, a fairly sensible DC output of about half of this value here. So that circuit certainly seems to be working. Now, so how good is our peak detector? How faithfully does the output voltage reflect the input voltage? To understand this, we are going to change the input peak-to-peak -peak amplitude coming from our AD9850 by sliding that potentiometer uh, control all the way from maximum down to somewhere near minimum. And then we are going to record point by point uh, the peak-to-peak -peak voltage in from our oscilloscope. Remember to have it uh, either on the input side of the capacitor or AC coupled so you're really measuring the uh, peak voltage of the uh, positive side and that will be one number and then we're going to measure the DC voltage out of the peak detector and that will be a second number and then we'll change the input voltage and so on. Uh, if you want to you can use the original data entry and plot version 1 program which lets you input these points uh, as pairs um, uh, on the keyboard from idle. I prefer entering the data into notepad and you see an example here because you can edit it if you make a mistake. So I opened notepad and I recorded here the voltage I measured for my peak to peak voltage on the O1 oscilloscope going into the peak detector and I recorded here the voltage I measured out of the peak detector. This is the DC level on channel 2. So these both these programs will display the data and ask for starting parameters for a linear fit. We hope the relationship between the input peak-to-peak -peak voltage and the output uh, voltage is linear. And uh, then you can fit the uh, data that you've read in from your CSV file that you saved on Notepad. The, um, here's the comment field from uh, the data entry and plot v2. And so please download that program, put it into idle, take these measurements and see what the data looks like. So here is the fit to the data I measured by hand in the last set of data shown in that notepad file. So this is the output volts here versus the uh, input volts peak to peak. And you can see it is reasonably linear, certainly not perfectly so, 
but reasonably linear um, up to uh, about one and three quarter volts of input. Okay, so I will let you repeat these steps and calibrate your own circuit at home. And this is probably a point where you want to stop the video and do just that. Okay, assuming that you've done this and you've now come back to this video, uh, let's go on um, to talk about frequency response here. So what we're going to do now is either take the potentiometer out altogether and just feed the input of the AD9850 straight into the board or leave the potentiometer cranked up all the way. My advice is to take it out altogether because if you knock it, it can change the value a little bit. So I would just put a constant voltage from the AD9850 in. And as we saw before, it works out to uh, 10 megahertz or so. What does this circuit measure out to? Okay, so what we're going to do then is program from the keyboard using our AD9850 uh, test program. We're just going to put in some frequencies, and here's the list of the frequencies I put in. I started at 100 hertz, and then I went all the way here to uh, looks like 10 megahertz. Is it? Let me count this. No, one. Wait a moment. One, two, three, four. Okay, 10 kilohertz uh, in this file. I know I went further. And um, don't go higher than 30 megahertz because the um, float conversion in your Python program will not handle uh, those frequencies. So I made a CSV file here of frequency in this column and uh, the output of the peak uh, to peak detector measured on the O1 oscilloscope here. And then I've written yet another program called semilog plot version 1.py. The reason is when we cover a large range of frequencies, we really need to use a uh, logarithmic scale for frequency um, in order to accommodate the very large uh, range of data that you will be measuring. And here's the result. So what we've done now um, is to plot what was in that CSV file. And so you can see actually that the peak-to-peak -peak detector is much more limited than the AD9850. Remember, the AD9850 looked quite good out to several megahertz, but you can see it's falling off here at about 40 kilohertz. And you actually see at the low end that below a couple of hundred um, hertz, you're beginning to see the onset of droop as that 0.47 microfarad capacitor and one mega ohm resistor discharge between peaks. So you have a range here of a couple of hundred hertz out to 40 kilohertz or so over which your peak detector is good. Now the thing that is actually killing this here is that our dear old op amp, while it makes a perfect diode, doesn't make a very fast diode, uh, it has to slew from one voltage to the next as the diode passes through zero volts. I forgot to mention this earlier in the video, but if you look very carefully at when the peak detector turns on again, uh, when it's used without a capacitor, you'll see a little bit of noise as the op amp was saying, help, help, I can't go negative, and uh, was shut down and then turned on again suddenly when the voltage went positive. Um, this is the, uh, called the uh, slewing of the amplifier when it tries to go from one voltage rail to the next, and that's quite slow. And that's why um, this circuit is not working above about 40 kilohertz. Okay, well, I will let you go and calibrate your own circuit. Now, assuming you have calibrated your circuit, the next step is to automate uh, the whole process. I've done this uh, for you by writing Python code called AD9850 scan and record. So you can get this um, either from a Word file, depending on the website where it's stored, or a text file. If it's a Word file, paste it again into Notepad, save it, and take the pure text and paste that into idle, and uh, then save as a .py file. 
And so here is the comment field for this um, particular program. It tells you what it does. It scans the output of the AD9850 between a lower frequency and an upper frequency. And because we're going to be using a log scale, it doesn't increment the frequency in equal steps. It increments it in equal multiples. So in other words, it'll do F and then say 1.1 times F and then 1.1 times that frequency and so on so that it samples equally on a log scale. It also records the DC voltage on pin A0, uh, which we will connect to the output of our peak detector. So this program is stepping the signal generator uh, through a, a range of frequencies. Um, there's a delay in it to let it settle. Uh, so remember that capacitor has to discharge if things are going down in amplitude. Um, there's a delay in here to let it settle and it'll record the value on A0 and go on to the next frequency. So these are all the files you need. We've talked uh, about most of them. Um, we're using Pi for Marta, of course, to control the Arduino. This is exactly what we had before. Uh, NumPy for these uh, conversions into 32 bits that we need. Uh, sleep for the delays. We're going to be writing a CSV file, so we've, we've imported the CSV module for writing the CSV files. And then I've also imported date time so that we can timestamp our files. Once again, I, I hate overwriting data files because I forgot to change a name or typing names in and forgetting where I stored them. So I like timestamping my files. OK, so this is exactly as before. We um, open the Arduino port here. So board um, is an object assigned to this Arduino here. Arduino of port is the communications that is contained in this package here, this Arduino package. And the port is defined to be COM3 in my case, so it'll go to COM3. In your case, you'll want to put in the COM port that your device manager has told you where your Arduino is. Uh, we're then going to go and sleep for a second uh, while the Arduino does its thing. And then if there is no error, it'll go to the next step in the program and you'll see Arduino online. All right. We're going to define some constants uh, for this program. These are the pins that we used before to program our AD9850. And this was the state variable that is used for sending logical bits to the board. And then these are some variables associated with receiving and converting the data. I'm just opening two arrays of uh, size 512. Remember the instruction for doing this is an array with an element 0 multiplied by 512 will now create an array in Python with 512 zeros. If you want to take more than 512 data points, this is where you would modify this program. And we're actually going to use a second array um, to dump the data down because I don't want a bunch of empty points if we lose yet less than 512. And k and length are used for counting positions in the array. Uh, they're actually uh, somewhat um, redundant and, and interchangeable, but I just like having two um, separate indices to do two separate things, even although I could use one if I was going to be clever. All right, so we set up the Arduino. Um, now we do some things in addition to what we did before to program our 9850. So these were the um, digital output modes set up to send your 32-bit programming number and control signals to the Arduino. However, we now have an analog pin uh, expression from PySomata. It's in this board module here that we loaded at the beginning of the program. And it's get pin. A means analog. 0 means pin 0. And I means input. So this instruction now sets pin 0, um, A0 to analog input. We also set up this uh, iterator. So this is also contained in the board module. This was the separate thread, although it's not really a pure thread because your, your computer doesn't have uh, multiple parallel chips. But it sets up a separate thread that's running independently of the main program, pinging pin 0 to say, have you got an input? Have you got an input? 
and then we start the iterator here. So we're ready to go now. We're ready to output the Arduino and we're ready to read from it. These are all the functions we had before, the pulse high, byte transfer and frequency set. So this is no different from uh, the earlier program. And so now we begin our program. So uh, we take in our Arduino supply volts so we can convert the zero to one from the Arduino into whatever the actual voltage is. And then as always, it's um, strings from the keyboard which we need to convert to a float. So we do that here, a start frequency, a finish frequency, and a step multiplier. All right, so we set our um, frequency equal to the starting frequency input above. Freak set, if we go back one, is this function here that sets the frequency through the Arduino, calling those other um, functions defined above. And then we do an analog pin dot read to set this variable data equal to what is read from analog pin zero as an input. And then we change that to volts read by taking the float of data and multiplying it by the Arduino volts. Once again, data will be a number between 0 and 1 in Pythomata. And then we set the first uh, elements of the X array equal to this frequency number and the um, first element of the Y array equal to the voltage read. So now the main program. So we're going to run through this loop here while this variable frequency is less than the final frequency that we input up here, we'll increase this index, increase this length index. I really don't need both of them, but I left them in for clarity. And then we increment the frequency by multiplying it by step. And then we set the frequency. Remember, freak set was this function defined above equal to the frequency. Then we read in the data and convert it to volts again. And then we set this element here from the kth index. So k started at zero. We've gone to k plus one. So now we have the first index here and the first index here. We've filled the zeroth index. So this is the one index and the one index. We put frequency and volts right in. And we keep doing that as long as frequency is less than the finishing frequency. So now we've filled up our 512 element arrays. However, we've also counted how long the arrays are with this length counter here. We could have used K, but hey. So now what I'm doing is creating two new arrays, X out and Y out, which instead of being 512 elements long, are now um, elements, uh, now contain length number of elements. And now I simply loop through this for loop here um, to read the numbers in the X array into X out and the Y array into Y out. And then finally, I want to save the data. And so this is the from the um, date time module. Um, I get a string which tells me the date and timestamp. And then I open the CSV file using the CSV.writer module. Um, Notice I've introduced a new um, Python instruction here that I've only just learned, which is the with instruction. That is a much better version of try except. So it handles exceptions if, if the um, code can't open the file or something like that. Um, with is a good way to do it. So all you do is offset this within the with. Uh, otherwise, it's exactly the same code we've used for opening CSV files before. We then write um, uh, our data in over the range of length, if, which if you remember was the number of data points we actually read, depending on the starting frequency, the finishing frequency, and the step amount. And then the CSV writer module then writes a row containing X and Y, and that's it. So we then turn the chip off with a pulse high reset, and we exit the board. Okay, there's the code. You can load that up, you can run it. And so now I'm going to connect the uh, peak detector directly to the AD9850. And I'm going to sweep the frequency. So this is exactly the circuit we had before. Only now this output is connected to pin A0 
of the Arduino. So we step the frequency and we read what we get at the output. There was a delay in the program after writing the frequency, I believe of a second, uh, to let the RC time constant here settle down. And actually you'll see the transients as we switch from frequency to frequency when we look on the scope. I put my scope probe here to look at what was being driven into the peak detector. Another scope probe here to look at the output, just to see that everything was working while I was accumulating this value of voltage back on pin A0 of the Arduino. All right, let's run it. So here's a movie of me doing it. Okay, so I've loaded up the uh, code, which is the um, scan and run, or the run and scans, frequency sweep. I'm now running it. It's asking me to put in the supply volts. I measured 4.91. I'm starting at 100 hertz. I'm typing in, oh boy, I'm going all the way to 30 megahertz. I'm being ambitious here. I think 30 megahertz or, yeah, 300 kilohertz maybe. I'm not sure. But now look at this. Isn't this beautiful? You're sitting back, go pour yourself a coffee, and you're just measuring your data, storing it on the computer. You can see those nasty transients that we avoid with the sleep for one second command uh, in the program. So we're only reading it after the delay. And look at the frequency scanning upwards and the output of the peak detector um, being measured on the second channel. So I now have that data in a CSV file. Uh, so now I get to go to semilog plot v1.py. OK, and here we go. So this looks a lot like the point we got by uh, the plot we got by hand with just a few points of frequency um, of amplitude versus frequency for the uh, peak detector. But then we see this fall off again around 40 kilohertz. It looks very much like what we saw before. The droop here at low frequencies owing to the capacitor discharging just a little bit between cycles of the output of the AD9850, but otherwise pretty flat between 200 um, hertz and 40 kilohertz. And of course these points look evenly spaced because we took them with a multi multiplier um, step rather than a fixed step. And this is what your plots are going to look like in the uh, future when we scan a wide range of frequencies. And we can see that we're going to test our circuits here in this range of about 200 to, uh, hertz to 40 kilohertz, uh, not because of our AD9850, which is fantastic, but because of our peak detector, which isn't that fantastic, but it will do nicely. And most importantly, you have just learned how to automate an experiment, take data on your computer, which you can analyze on your computer, and uh, so you are now in the 21st century for data acquisition. Okay, we are going to use our AD9850 and our peak detector to explore reactive circuits in the next module.